Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Navara Live. I am your host for today's show, Dahlia Gabriel, and joining me is Helena, aka No Justice MTG, on YouTube and Twitch. How are you doing, Helena? I'm not doing too bad at all. I had a pretty good day today. Looking forward to the show, as always. Very happy to be here. Happy to have you joining us. So, Coming up later tonight, a NatCon event in Brussels featuring Nigel Farage and Suella Braverman has been shut down by police. Smoking could be phased out for an entire generation by legislation going through the Commons tonight. And the New York Times have instructed staff not to use important terms for Israel's war in Gaza, such as genocide and Palestine. Stay tuned for all of that. And a quick notice before we're going, doing our little civic duty. Um, if you didn't already know, Midnight tonight is the deadline to register to vote in the upcoming May 2nd local and mayoral elections. So if you haven't registered, now's the time to do so or check with friends and family to make sure that they are registered to vote. And also remember, you now need to have ID to vote. So make sure that you don't forget that as well. Israel has given its clearest indication yet of its intention to respond to Iran's retaliatory attack that took place at the weekend. The Navatim Air Base is, in southern Israel is one of the two Israeli air bases that was hit by at least nine of Iran's ballistic missiles. According to US officials, visiting the base, IDF chief of the general staff, Herzi Halavi, said this. We are closely assessing the situation. We remain at our highest level of readiness. Iran will face the consequences for its actions. We will choose our response accordingly. The IDF remains ready to counter any threat from Iran and its terror proxies as we continue our mission to defend the State of Israel. IDF spokesperson Daniel Hagari also visited the Julius military base, where he said this. We cannot stand still from this kind of aggression. Iran will not get off scot-free with this aggression. We will respond in our time, in our place, in the way that we will choose. Israel's military threats are also being backed by a political push. Israel's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Israel Katz, revealed this. Alongside the military response to the firing of the missiles and the UAVs, I am leading a diplomatic offensive against Iran. This morning, I sent letters to 32 countries and spoke with dozens of foreign ministers and leading figures around the world calling for sanctions to be imposed on the Iranian missile project and that the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps be declared a terrorist organization as a way to curb and weaken Iran. Iran must be stopped now before it is too late. It's not clear which countries Katz has written to, but the IRGC is already a prescribed organization in the US and is subject to sanctions by the EU and UK. As Israel's war cabinet meets to discuss its response for the third day in a row, Iran has also indicated how it would respond to any military aggression from Israel. Its deputy foreign minister has said the country would respond in seconds to any Israeli counterattack. Ali Bagheri Khani said this. In case of repetition of another mistake, Israel should expect a harsher, faster, and more immediate response. This time, the Zionists should know that they will not have a 12-day long time space. The response that they are going to receive this time around cannot be measured by days or hours, but by seconds. In the wake of Israel's threats to retaliate, Iran has also temporarily closed its nuclear facilities sites that Israel has attempted to sabotage throughout the 2020s. Meanwhile, Israeli officials have already begun to characterize any response as a security issue rather than an offense. This was Israeli ambassador to the UK, Zippy Hotalevi, on LBC. Just like you, I follow the news coming from Israel. It's uh, the war cabinet that will decide in the coming few hours about any type of, of response. Um, I want to tell you, we, we don't work here for any revenge. I think it's not the game. The game here is deterrence. No one wants its country to be attacked with missiles, with drones, the, the same drones hurting Ukraine, with the same Iranians drones. So we need to make sure our country won't be paralyzed. The country was paralyzed Saturday night. You, you, you could see no schools. People were uh, sleeping in, in bomb shelters. Mm. This is not the way of a modern country to function. So if we want Israel to function, we must make sure this type of threat won't exist. 
A different argument might go, if you don't want your country attacked, maybe don't bomb other countries' consulates. It's almost as though only Israel, and not Iran, or for that matter Palestine, has the right of self-defense against aggression. Hotovelli then went on to make the case for British involvement in Israel's response. One thing Britain knows more than any other country in the world, by not doing anything against aggressor, you also can create escalation. So if Iran knows that Israel is easy to target, maybe you'll be next. Maybe the UK will be next to uh, show this type of performance. We've seen Saturday night of massive attack of drones. Uh, you've seen it in Ukraine. Why you think the Iranians, they won't hesitate to do it here as well? Her logic there of escalating to de-escalate is completely homicidal. She is relying on might and power instead of any other avenues to peaceful coexistence. Others in the UK have seen in Iran's retaliation against Israel an opportunity to enrich the arms trade. Senior defence figures are now calling for the UK to invest in its own Iron Dome of land-based missile systems to protect London and nuclear power stations. Former chairman of the Commons Defence Committee, Tobias Elwood, told The Telegraph this. We need to prepare for all scenarios. We need to prepare for a multitude of types of attack from the non-state to state actors. And that will require investments absolutely in an Iron Dome for the UK. This must be seen as a wake-up call. We must recognise where the world is going. We need to invest. It's absolutely important to spend 3% of GDP. How do we spend it? This air defence is a great example. Helena, what do you make of Elwood's claim that this moment requires Britain to invest even more than it already does in the military-industrial complex? Well, I have no necessary op- like opposition to the idea of spending like, some of our defence budget that already exists on things like missile defence, but this is something we already have a commitment to through the European Sky Shield Initiative. We already have our current military budget going towards you know, missile defence systems. That's fine. That's explicitly something that's being used to ward off other people's attacks. I have no problem with this, but all of these discussions about this desire to raise military spending on everything, all of this kind of saber rattling that people are doing around, or we need to ensure that we're trying to maximize like military recruitment, for example. It's worth pointing out the reason why Israel has the Iron Dome that it does have is because of its position that it exists in with regards to the Middle East conflict. It's a currently a, you know, a belligerent occupier for half a century of the Palestinian territories. And that's why they keep getting attacked. And that's why they have you spending huge amounts of both their money and the United States' money on a missile defense system. Again, fine to have a defense system, but you wouldn't need to spend all this money if you stop being a belligerent occupier. And again, they're all talking about this that we might be seeing some kind of broader conflict. I'm like, the chances of us actually getting invaded as an island nuclear state that's a member of NATO is infinitesimal at this point. So if they do want to say brattle towards there being more military recruitment, extra expansion of our military industrial complex, this is only ever going to go towards NATO back towards elsewhere which we shouldn't be needing to do. We shouldn't have to be spending so much of our capacity, which we already spend the NATO minimum on this, essentially only to be there to be able to fight NATO's proxy wars for them that might theoretically happen in the future, rather than engaging in actual genuine defence, which I actually have no opposition to spending if we were actually doing it on defence rather than broader block politics and escalation of that matter. The answer is never to actually work towards de-escalation and actually address the core issue of why these cycles of violence continue and the role that the British military industrial complex has historically played in that. Um, But anyway, away from fantasy missiles, actual missiles continue to fall on Gaza, which has almost no defense to them whatsoever. Four Palestinians were killed in an airstrike on Rafah overnight in which a residential house was destroyed. They were all believed to be internal refugees from northern Gaza who had moved repeatedly in order to find safety in Rafah. One of them was reportedly just a teenager. Reports are also emerging in the last hour of an Israeli missile strike on a playground in Mehrzi refugee camp in northern Gaza. According to Al Jazeera, at least 11 children have been killed. The play area was constructed by volunteers for displaced children already traumatized by the war. Footage that is too graphic to show features horrific scenes of their broken bodies, as well as further injuries amongst bystanders. Attacks have also taken place in Nusayret's refugee camp in central Gaza. 
And it's from there that this footage has emerged. <laughs> That was reportedly an Israeli quadcopter at Nusayrat. That's a kind of surveillance drone. And it's emitting the sound of a baby crying. According to reports, when Palestinians go to investigate or help, they're shot at. But the news gets even grimmer. At Al Shifa Hospital, medical workers say they have unearthed a mass grave of Palestinians. The medical complex was placed under siege for two weeks by Israeli soldiers in March during which multiple reports of abuses, killings and detentions emerged. So far, nine bodies have reportedly been exhumed, some with medical bandages and catheters still attached to them. It's these kinds of outrageous atrocities that mean growing numbers of people around the world find themselves unable to stand by and allow Israel's war to continue with impunity. In the US, a National Day of Action for Palestine has taken place. Protesters crowded onto the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, shutting it down for around five hours. Demonstrators also chained themselves together, used vehicles to block lanes, and held signs saying stop the world for Gaza. Simultaneous protests took place in New York, Washington, Oregon, and other states, closing highways, bridges, and airports. And once again, The gap between the position of elected officials and many of their constituents on the question of Gaza is becoming increasingly obvious. A conference featuring the who's who of the European far right has been shut down by the mayor of Brussels. The National Conservatism Conference was set to host names like Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban, Nigel Farage and French far right figure Eric Zemmour. However, just two hours after it began, Belgian police arrived at the event, turned the lights on like someone's mum at a house party, and told everyone to go home. Shortly after, the mayor of the Brussels district, where the conference was meant to take place, said this on Twitter. I issued an order from the mayor to ban the National Conservatism Conference event to guarantee public safety. In Etterbeek, Brussels City, and San Jos, the far right is not welcome. According to Politico, the justification given by police to organisers was that the event posed a threat to public order, as a counter-protest was meant to take place later that evening. The conference had already had to change venue twice due to other mayors in the Brussels regions refusing to allow the event to go ahead in their districts. As you can imagine, the police's action caused quite a stir. And here's the response from former Home Secretary Suella Braverman, who was slated to speak at the conference. I'm here with like-minded Democrats, elected, uh, democratically elected politicians, leaders and experts in their fields, and we are here talking about the issues that matter to the British people, but also many citizens around Europe, securing our borders, making our communities safer, um, and how to uh, protect our uh, our countries. And uh, it's a real shame that the thought police, um, instructed by the mayor of Brussels, who saw fit to try and undermine and uh, denigrate what is free speech and free debate. Um, I I remember the words of Mrs. Thatcher, and I'm going to misquote her, but the more ridiculous and far-fetched and extremist their attempts are to silence us, the more cheered on I am, because it just shows that they've lost the political argument. And just finally on this, I mean, you're a former Home Secretary, you know the police, you know the law in the UK. Do you think this could happen in the UK? Listen, what what really does uh, concern me here about what's happened here in Brussels is that last year, uh, only last year, the Mayor of Brussels was happy to host the mayor of Tehran here in Brussels, and yet he seems to be pretty offended by, as I say, democratically elected politicians, people from all over the European continent who are giving voice to millions of people talking about things like securing our borders. Uh, Could this happen in the UK? I I generally think we have a a culture of uh, freedom of speech. We value uh, debate and the free flow of ideas. It's a cherished foundation of our democracy and long may it continue. Now, it's pretty hypocritical for Suella Braverman, of all people, to be condemning the police for breaking up a political gathering. After all, this is the same woman who, while she was Home Secretary, routinely accused police of being too lenient when it came to pro-Palestine marches. 
Braverman also called for further action to be taken against the protests, which she mischaracterized as hate marches. So what seemed to happen here was that, in the eyes of the mayor at least, this conference was, well, a hate conference, which required further action. Maybe he thought so because previous national conservatism conferences have hosted some pretty out there speeches. In last year's event, for example, right-wing commentator Douglas Murray said this. This is in some ways uh, still a uh, controversial thing to say. Because in Europe in particular, nationalism, after all, sounds different depending on the country you're in. Nationalism in Israel sounds different to nationalism in America, sounds different to nationalism in Italy, sounds different to nationalism here in Britain. But the cordon sanitaire, which used to exist around nationalism until recent years, existed not because we didn't trust the idea of love of country, not because, I would argue, there was anything wrong with nationalism in a British context. It all came from my recognition that there was a problem with nationalism in a German context. And that is simply a historical fact. But I see no reason why every other country in the world should be prevented from feeling pride in itself because the Germans mucked up twice in a century. Hmm, not sure a genocide counts as a muck-up, really. And in a double whammy, the same conference also saw Conservative MP Miriam Cates blaming cultural Marxism for the loss of hope in young people. Cultural Marxism, of course, being a widely considered an anti-Semitic dog whistle. And I'm pretty sure it's not actually cultural Marxism, but rather over a decade of austerity, an increasingly aggressive and punitive state, and the enduring horizon of climate breakdown that's causing young people in Britain to lose hope. Helena, what do you make of all this commotion down in Brussels? I think first of all, I would say is I actually very much disagree with the mayor of Brussels deciding to break up the conference, purely on grounds of the fact that if we don't allow this kind of a level of congregation of people that we vehemently disagree with, and I believe is rightly to disagree with, that can, the rhetoric can then same be used on us if there's diplomatic, sorry, democratic support for it. The kind of McCarthyism of saying, well, we can't let the communists be meeting up in Brussels at the same time. This is the kind of the, it's very much the kind of liberal approach to dealing with these issues is trying to ban it rather than dealing with the problem. Also quite interesting that Braverman and Farage have decided to go all the way over to Brussels to try and parrot their ideology. Because interestingly, whilst there is a rise, a very large rise in nationalism sweeping across Europe, in the UK, it actually doesn't have that much of a kind of foothold in our society. It's turned people off the Conservatives. Some people have gone towards kind of reform UK into the nationalism, but it's only a small proportion of the population, whereas there's a much bigger market for it in the European continent very specifically. And careerists like Braverman are very happy to try and travel the world to try and become this kind of new political figure, as we saw with her backbench trip to Israel last week. So again, the liberal approach to this problem to try and ban this from existence, because well, as you've mentioned before, the issue that's caused the rise in nationalism across Europe is a failure to deal with material conditions. But unless you deal with them, you can ban all of the far right conferences that you want, because that won't make the ideology go away. In fact, it will give these people a grievance narrative about how they're being shut out of the conversation by the establishment to be able to grift towards a, finer, a, a wider audience. You have to fix material problems that have plagued Europe for the last however many years, for the last 40 years or so, that's caused the continual rise towards where we are right now. Globalization and continual deference towards the corporate culture of neoliberalism has allowed all of the jobs and the manufacturing jobs within the, broadly across the European continent, all that getting subcontracted out to the global south, employing people on garbage wages to therefore hollow out the manufacturing capacity of these countries, which they're never going to get back. They don't have the kind of financial services sector that we do. And we're seeing the failures, as Aaron pointed out last week, across the European economy. And this general malaise in terms of the working classes, especially in these countries, is not being solved by liberal politics over there. And on top of that, we have the continual kind of cultural problem we see with people come up against the refugee crisis all across Europe. And of course, this is a big problem of Western interventionism that's continued uh, ever since you know, the very much the last three decades in which this period has led up to. We've continually 
been intervening in countries, destabilizing regions and causing gigantic refugee crises. And unless we fix these material conditions that are leading to the rise of these nationalist forces across Europe, offer an alternative, a proper, realistic grassroots alternative that's going to bring these people across in economic terms, rather than allow them to get sidelined by kind of cultural conservatism, we will, they will never be able to to solve these issues by trying to ban it away from relevancy because it'll only find other channels to be able to promote itself. Having the police breaking up far-right gatherings is not real anti-fascism. It's not the kind of, it's not substantive anti-fascism that really gets to, to the core of it. I think it's just funny watching Suella Braverman getting a little taste of her own medicine and being kind of upset about it. MPs are currently debating Rishi Sunak's plan to create a smoke-free generation in Britain. The government's cigarettes and vapes bill would each year increase the age that it's legal to buy tobacco products. If the bill passes into law, someone born in 2009 or later will never be able to buy cigarettes legally. Now, it may seem obvious that the harder it is to get addicted to smoking, the better. According to the House of Commons Library, tobacco use is a leading cause of preventable death and hospitalization. But the issue has sparked a classic debate between freedom of choice and government regulation, a debate that has divided the Tory party. On BBC Breakfast, England's chief medical officer Chris Whitty had this to say about the debate. What do you say to any MPs who aren't going to support this today? Well, I think, uh, I mean, there are many MPs who will obviously be thinking what they want to do. And I, I, leaving aside the health uh, damage, which is extraordinary, the economic damage, which is, as you said in your lead up, substantial. Um, the thing I want people to think about really is the fact that people are trapped in smoking at a, a very young age. Uh, and once they become addicted, their choice is taken away. So if you're in favour of choice, you should be against something which takes away people's choices the majority, great majority of smokers wish they'd never started, but now they're in trouble. And if I can just give one anecdote on this, uh, when I was a, um, a, a junior doctor doing surgery, I remember the tragedy of seeing people whose legs had been had to be cut off because of the smoking that had damaged their arteries outside the hospital, uh, weeping as they lit up because they were trapped by addiction. That is not choice. So Chris Whitty there is arguing that this isn't a freedom issue because addicts aren't necessarily acting freely when they feed their addictions. But for some Tories, the freedom to become addicted to cigarettes is an important one. This was former Prime Minister Liz Truss speaking in the House of Commons. The reason I'm speaking today is I am very concerned that this policy putting, put, being put forward is emblematic of a technocratic establishment in this country that wants to limit people's freedom. And I think that is a problem. I will not give way to the Honourable Lady. I will not give way. I'll give away exactly as much opportunity as the opposition gave me to talk about my private members' bill, oh, which I'll come yeah. on to later in this speech. Here, here. But the problem is, the instinct of this establishment, and which is reflected by a cross-party consensus today in today's chamber, is to believe that they, that the government, are better at making decisions for people than people themselves. And I absolutely agree that that is true for the under 18s. It is very important until people have decision-making capability while they are growing up that we protect them. But I think the whole idea that we can protect adults from themselves is hugely problematic and it effectively infantilizes people. Trust went on to argue that protecting the freedom to live your life however you want it is a fundamental conservative value. So why not run that one past trans people or religious minorities or asylum seekers, or indeed by people who want to take drugs that aren't tobacco and nicotine? This was Tory MP Dr Caroline Johnson. In reality, there are some products that are banned for adults, things like cocaine, heroin, and others. So society as a whole has made a choice that some products must be banned for adults 
as well as children. It's just where you put that line. And in reality, unless you're prepared to say, uh, you said that you know, people should be able to do whatever they want as adults, but in actual fact, unless you want to liberalise uh, laws on, on drugs and allow people to have cocaine and heroin and everything else, which maybe you do, then there has to be a line drawn somewhere, and it's just a case of where you put it. Truss's reply to that point was that addiction to cocaine or heroin has negative impacts on the people around the addict, something that isn't the case with tobacco addiction. But that's just not true. According to the Royal College of Physicians, the effects of secondhand smoke on children are profound. A 2010 study reported this. New estimates for key measures of health damage attributable to passive smoking, which for children each year causes over 20,000 cases of lower respiratory tract infection, 120,000 cases of middle ear disease, at least 22,000 new cases of wheeze and asthma, 200 cases of bacterial meningitis, 40 sudden infant deaths, that's one in five of all SIDS. And each year, these cases generate over 300,000 UK GP consultations and about 9,500 hospital admissions and cost the NHS about £23.3 million. Those figures only concern people who live close to smokers, but of course we all live in a society that bears the costs, economic and emotional, of dealing with highly preventable illnesses. This was the Shadow Health Secretary, Wes Streeting. They say the progressive ban on smoking is unconservative. Well, let me tell them what is unconservative, Mr Deputy Speaker. The heaviest tax burden in 70 years. And it will get heavier if we do not act to prevent ill health. If we continue down the road the Conservatives have put us on, with more and more people suffering, falling sick and falling out of the workforce, we won't just be letting those people down, we will all be paying a heavy price for it too. The cost of sickness and disability benefits are due to rise on their watch from £65 billion this year to over £90 billion by the end of the next Parliament. The budget for the NHS is £165 billion this year and the health service is not coping with existing demands. If society continues to get less healthy, those demands will only rise. If the health service and our welfare service are to be made sustainable for the future, then we must act to prevent ill health in the first place. What better way to do that than wiping out the leading cause of cancer? Why is West Streeting's answer to everything always, I'm actually the more conservative one? I just don't get it. Anyway, it's important to remember that what's being proposed is a ban on selling cigarettes to people born in 2009 or later. It's not a ban on smoking altogether. And new polling by Savanta shows that the phased ban on cigarette sales is popular amongst the electorate, with 59% in favour of the measures and only 20% opposed. Helena, do you think that this is banning things like smoking is actually an appropriate response to a public health crisis? And what do you think about the kinds of divisions that this is making within the Tory party? Well, interestingly enough, I actually don't have a particularly like fully formed opinion on this. I do really kind of see kind of both sides of the discussion on this one. And I think there's kind of three main arguments you have to go down with regards to something like this, which is what, wh- whether it impinges too much on people's freedoms, the broader utility of it, and whether it's cost effective or not. Like, of course, when you look about freedom, it's not just you know, negative freedoms, but also positive freedoms as well. It's not just, is the state stopping you from being able to do the smoking that you want to do? But is your engaging in smoking, it gets into taking other people's freedoms to not live in a smoke-free world, for example. That's one argument you have to look through. Would a ban even work? Would a ban on selling cigarettes to a certain new demographic of people, an age and therefore lower than that, would that therefore lead to a higher black market of trying to sell these to people? Would it even necessarily mean they can't get them through alternative means? On top of that, in terms of the broad society utility, we've already talked about a lot of the health harms that, that passive smoking can cause and broader harms that people can get into if they accidentally start smoking through some kind of social pressure outside of their own control. But on top of that, on top of that, the addiction that you get into is explicitly being done for the profit of gigantic mega corporations, taking advantage of a broader societal sickness to line their own pockets. Then when you think about the cost overall to the state, 
broadly when I was looking into it, the broad kind of state cost for all of the different after effects from smoking related illness is roughly between kind of 10 to 20 billion pounds a year, looking at the estimates that I'd seen across multiple different facets of public spending. Yet the excise duty that we pay on cigarettes over the course of a year, remember it's just excise duty that matters here because with regard to things like VAT, the money they wouldn't spend on cigarettes would usually be spent on other things that are also VAT applicable. So just in terms of the excise duty on cigarettes, that raises £10 billion to the Treasury. So if you take those kind of costs at face value, there is indeed somehow a way in which that we can make more money for the state by engaging in a ban like this because of the overall savings that you have in terms of broader health implications across society. So I do understand why libertarian types think that you know, the state engaging in this might be a ban that's a step too far, considering the kind of cultural significance that it has in society. And that when you look at a prohibition of alcohol in the United States, it didn't really have the desired effect. I think broadly, when you look at the overall balance of either side issue, I think I'm more likely to go alongside the idea of banning it is broadly better for society overall. But it's interesting when you look at the Conservative Party, they have seen a lot of the time across many different issues, a libertarian authoritarian split. They're, they're broadly a, a very right wing party. Of course, we've seen that all the time. But there is plenty of levels of authoritarianism that lots of conservatives are happy to engage in. But when it comes to libertarianism, they seem to be a little bit kind of muddled on their messaging. It's interesting, I was watching Liz Truss's podcast appearance with Ian Dale yesterday. And she said, well, I'm a libertarian at heart, but then talks about how she wants to kind of close down the borders. And I'm just like, well, if you're a libertarian, then sure you, you believe in people's freedoms to be able to want to you know, live wherever they want. And the same comes down to this as well, in the, okay, well, you know, you want to be a libertarian in terms of tobacco policy, but where are your calls to decriminalize something like marijuana, which has far less of a wider societal negative impact in terms of utility than tobacco does, especially given how wide scale it is and the, you know, the kind of the differences in the ways in which they might affect people based upon kind of you know, physical health as opposed to kind of mental health and things like that. So there are a lot of splits along conservative ideology that have been kind of shown to us across many different facets of their policy prospectus over the last kind of four years or so. And this is kind of the thin end of the wedge, really. Yeah, I think I broadly come from a similar approach of like, I'm kind of almost confused by why this is the wedge issue that the Conservatives are going to cause splits amongst themselves over. And I generally find that the sort of conservative libertarian approach increasingly is all about getting really hit up on freedoms that aren't actually that highly staked whilst actually being quite authoritarian on the freedoms that really, really matter. Freedom to protest, freedom to um, freedom to, to move, you know, the kind of fundamental freedoms upon which everything else is built. But I also think there's an incoherency. I mean, I generally don't believe that banning things um, actually, I don't think prohibition really works. Uh, I think that actually a lot of the measures that have been taken, things like reduce, you know, not being able to smoke in indoor spaces. I think the, you know, putting cigarettes in really unattractive packaging, having it out of sight, not allowing cigarettes to be advertised. I think these are all much better measures of actually reducing the number of people who start smoking. Whereas again, like you said, when you start to to get into this prohibition cycle, you end up just pushing it underground. But I also think this is incredibly incoherent because if you want to talk about addictive substances that have negative impacts on the person engaging in the addictive substance and everyone around them, surely alcohol is like number one on that list. I mean, alcoholism is a drug. Alcohol is a drug that not only is deeply addictive, but even if you are a casual user of it, even if you know, you're know you just someone who gets drunk every so often, people who are drunk are far more likely to cause harm to those around them than someone smoking a cigarette or someone you know smoking a joint. So really, when you hold it up in that kind of context, it's sort of like, why are you picking this particular fight? Because it doesn't kind of make sense as something to fight about now um, on any of the particular grounds. On a freedom ground, it's like, okay, we're talking about the freedom to get addicted to cigarettes or the freedom to smoke. Look, this is the last of the freedoms that I'm currently concerned that are under attack by this conservative government. You're talking about 
public health crisis. Well, there are loads of other substances that we could go after that are causing public health crises. And then obviously the fact that we know historically that really prohibition is not the best way to, to tackle addiction. And that's in the case of all addictive substances. Um, so that's probably my kind of muddled views on that. Um, also, you know, the vote is is um, just to kind of remind um, people at home, the vote on that bill is going to take place just after our show at 7pm. It's a free vote, which means that, you know, the cab cabinet members aren't whipped into voting in a particular way with the government. And Kemi Badnock is the first cabinet minister who has declared that they will not be voting with the government. So we'll be voting against the ban. The New York Times have faced internal upheaval since October 7th over their coverage of Israel's war in Gaza. But now it has emerged that the paper has instructed journalists to restrict the use of the terms genocide and ethnic cleansing and to avoid fr the phrase occupied territory when describing Palestinian land. Not only that, they have told journalists not to use the word Palestine except in very rare cases. This story is coming from The Intercept, who obtained a copy of the internal memo, which was first distributed to New York Times journalists in November. The memo also outlines that reporters shouldn't use the term refugee camps to describe areas of Gaza where displaced Palestinians are now being located after being expelled from other parts of Palestine during previous Israeli-Arab wars. The Intercept say this. The memo, written by Times Standards editor Susan Westling, international editor Philip Pan and their deputies, quote, offers guidance about some terms and other issues we have grappled with since the start of the conflict in October. While the document is presented as an outline for maintaining objective journalistic principles in reporting on the Gaza war, several Times staffers told The Intercept that some of its contents show evidence of the paper's deference to Israeli narratives. One New York Times newsroom source who requested anonymity said this to The Intercept about the memo. I think it's the kind of thing that looks professional and logical if you have no knowledge of the historical context of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. But if you do know, it will be clear how apologetic it is to Israel. On the memo's direction of the term occupied territories, it says this. When possible, avoid the term and be specific, e.g. Gaza, the West Bank, etc., as each has a slightly different status. So here they're referring to the fact that Gaza, the West Bank and East Jerusalem are all considered to be occupied Palestinian territories in the eyes of the UN and most of the world. In relation to the term occupied territories being discouraged, an NYT staffer said this. You are basically taking the occupation out of the coverage, which is the actual core of the conflict. It's like, oh, let's not say occupation because it might make it look like we're justifying a terrorist attack. The memo also includes some advice about how to describe a one-sided war that's seen the number killed on one side grow to nearly 30 times more than those killed on the other. Quote, the nature of the conflict has led to inflammatory language and incendiary accusations on all sides. We should be very cautious about using such language, even in quotations. Our goal is to provide clear, accurate information, and heated language can often obscure rather than clarify the fact. Words like slaughter, massacre, and carnage often convey more emotion than information. Think hard before using them in our own voice. That advice minimizes the scale of death being imposed by Israel on Gaza and the manner in which it's being carried out. But it's also hypocritical. The Intercept's own analysis of articles written in the New York Times shows that between October 7th and November 24th last year, the paper has described Israelis being killed as a massacre on 53 occasions. Of the many, many times that Palestinians in Gaza have been killed, the New York Times has referred to a massacre just once. Remember, this is a war in which Israel has killed at least 15,000 children. And when it comes to using the word slaughter, the New York Times was happy to use it 22 times to refer to Israeli deaths and just once for Palestinians. Now, this is the paper of record for the United States. It's the one that goes in the archives. But the memo also instructed journalists to avoid terms like genocide and ethnic cleansing, except in specific legal contexts. 
But then again, it got very prescriptive about what terms writers should use. This is the guidance on how to refer to Hamas fighters. It is accurate to use the term terrorism and terrorist in describing the acts of October 7th, which included the deliberate targeting of civilians in killings and kidnappings. We should not shy away from that description of the event or the attackers, particularly when we provide context and explanation. Avoid fighters when referring to the October 7th attack. The term suggests a conventional war rather than a deliberate attack on civilians. And be cautious in using militants, which is interpreted in different ways and may be confusing to readers. The thing is here is fighter is a purely descriptive term, whereas terrorist is arguably much more emotive and loaded, which is something the New York Times guidance said should be avoided. But also, I await the moment that the Times tells its journalists to start referring to the IDF whose indiscriminate attacks has inevitably caused death to civilians as being terrorists. After six months of relentless and targeted attacks on Palestinian civilians in Gaza, I'm sure it's coming any day now. But anyway, let's hear um, what the NYT had to say in response. A spokesperson said this. Issuing guidance like this is to ensure accuracy, consistency and nuance in how we cover the news in standard practice. Across all our reporting, including complex events like this, we take care to ensure our language and choices are sensitive, current and clear to our audiences. Helena, what do you make of this memo? First of all, I'd just like to say big ups to Ryan Grimm at The Intercept for his very his excellent reporting over the course of the, the Israel-Palestine conflict. And this is just another excellent piece of evidence from him and what good work he's done in ensuring we have some good coverage on this. Well, this is another instance of what is just false balance, right? It's this level of false balance. Now, Emily Maitlis talked about this in the run-up to the Brexit coverage, where saying, well, we have to have both sides of a discussion being given equal time on this, regardless of the merit of what they're saying here. Now, whilst I disagree with Emily Maitlis necessarily about how the BBC conducts that necessarily. I think that that kind of dynamic is exactly what's going on here. The New York Times is saying, well, we can't, we can't have these specific words or these specific descriptions being used because they might alter somebody just one side of the conflict here. Except the two sides they're trying to apportion balance to are the specific US State Department description of something and the broad international consensus on the other, as if these are two viewpoints of kind of equal weight. When they just are not, they just completely aren't. Take, for example, the dis- the not allowing the description in terms of occupied territory. This is the legal definition of what Israel engages in with regards to the Palestinian territories. Again, as I said before, 50-year belligerent occupation of the Palestinian territories, continually been having been doing so, condemned by countries around the world, but continually supported by the United States and other Western countries without any actual real criticism of what's going on there, up until very recently with some criticism of illegal settlers, because they're allies, they're allies to the West, they're allies to the United States. And therefore, therefore we will, they will give too much weight to a very specific US State Department line on this, even though it's with kind of zero merit whatsoever under the guise of balance, which is nonsensical. All it does is cover up the fact but there is US complicity in the funding, support, and the way that they've ignored and allowed Israel to engage in its land grabs and its occupation with complete impunity and with no ability to ever to ever undermine it because we already see that when it comes to UN Security Council meetings, the one country that continually defends Israel regardless of what they do has been the United States. One thing I think was really key though is the not being able to describe areas of where Palestinian refugees are living as refugee camps. I find this a really, really kind of telling piece of this. In the you know, throughout kind of the, the, uh, the New York Times reporting of this, remember they were the ones to break the story around, or one of the other outlets, I should say, who broke the story, quote unquote, about the Israel Israeli dossier alleging all of this UNRWA involvement with Hamas, which again is one of the reasons why. There's all this discussion over whether or not you can describe the Palestinians as refugees. The Israeli narrative on this one, specifically the Hasbara narrative on this, is that well, you can't call these people refugees because just because we kicked them out of their homes in 1940 or their their parents or whatever. And UNRWA is the group that they wanted to try and undermine because UNRWA treats the people who live in these refugee camps because they are the children of those who are displaced during the Nakba. They refuse to treat them as refugees, and specifically Israel doesn't like this because the points of inflection of 
the peace talks and of the Israel-Palestine peace process is the fact that Israel will not adhere to UN Resolution 194 of the Palestinian right of return. And they want to ensure that that never happens by trying to make sure that people who do live in refugee camps are not treated as refugees. So the language, even the language specifically of not even describing refugees as refugees or the places they live as camps based upon the way they've been displaced, very, very telling as how it essentially dovetails into specific pro-Israel narratives on how they want the broader conflict discussed. One last point as well is it's just another instance with this regard that we can't say massacre, you can't say slaughter, unless of course it's against Israel, right? If, if, if Israel get have their civilians killed, it's massacre, it's a slaughter. But if Palestinians do, then it's just you know collateral damage of a justified military attack or whatever it might be. Again, because when you, they won't use the word to describe it as occupied territories, that might let people know that this is an ongoing conflict in which under international law, occupied people have a right to resist their occupation. Because if you talk about like, massacres and sources of civilians, that is, again, I do agree that it's a motive, but you have to be balanced in how you cover this. And the fact they will use it against the people who are against US interests, but won't use it for Israel, incredibly telling, alongside all of the huge number of instances we've seen of the difference between active and passive voice across not just the NYT, but broader Western media on this, where they'll just say, Palestinians have died, rather than, you know, Hamas militants or Hamas terrorists, as the NYT would prefer, Hamas terrorists will kill, for example, Israeli civilians. Now, that is true. Hamas militants did kill Israeli civilians, but you'll, they'll never use that active voice when it comes to the deliberate attacks that we know kill civilians deliberately based upon the 972 expose of Lavender. They never use those same words for Israel actually killing civilians across the Palestinian territories. And at least now we know this isn't just some level of manufacturing consent that's implicit. It's being explicitly told in these guidelines to reporters in papers of record. This is how they have to discuss the conflict. Yeah, I think that that low grade kind of systemic dehumanization and human relative humanization is what we see here, where it's, you know, when the use of like very clinical and robotic language when it comes to describing the plight of Palestinians. You know, as you said, that passive voice of Palestinians have died, you know, or Palestinian casualties or whatever. Whereas when describing violence committed against Israelis, it, the language is humanizing because it conveys suffering and it conveys pain. Whereas it's almost as if Palestinians, when they experience loss or when they experience injury, when they are killed, it's somehow a painless, it's somehow mechanical and, and, and sterile. And when that happens on an ongoing, like when that happens consistently, it creates this low grade dehumanization um, that then makes it, you know, paves the way for further violence uh, to take place. And I think also this, this demand for under the guise of, of accuracy for clinical language when it comes to one side and yet the allowance of emotive language on the other side um, just goes to show how this kind of, how when wielded selectively, this kind of idea of protocol or rules-based order can become extremely destructive. Um, and extremely oppressive. Um, anyway, thank you so much, Helena, for joining me tonight. It was a pleasure chatting to you. Likewise, likewise. Always appreciate coming on. It's been an excellent show today and I look forward to next time. Thank you so much to all of you for tuning in. Make sure to come back tomorrow for another stream from 6pm. You've been watching Navara Media. Good night. <laughs>